Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. All right, so welcome again to a new episode of our podcast at Access to Perspectives. We will have an insightful conversation today with Letizia Bracco, um, who joins us from, sorry, where? Nancy. Nancy. <laughs> so Nancy in France. And so everyone, so um, yeah, welcome. First of all, warm welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm happy to be there. Okay, so for everyone, so for a little bit of context, um, Letizia and I have met um, through one of the working groups of the UNESCO Open Science Community. Um, where yeah. people meet in various groups and there's one for monitoring of open science practices around the world and Letizia you are um, in charge of or yeah basically um, leading or in, in management of the team that's in charge of the open science monitor which was built um, for France, but then uh, also being adopted by the global community as much as we've discussed or considered to be so. And yeah, so please, to get us started, if you could tell, tell us a little bit about your background, where you're coming from, how what's your academic background, and then also how you ended up now working on open science monitoring. Yeah, so thank you very much. So yeah, I'm based in Nancy, so it's in the northeast of France, so the University of Lorraine. Um, so my background is, um, well, I've been uh, doing some studies in history uh, to begin with, and afterwards, uh, I've moved to um, the library, um, library science and information science. So um, I've been a librarian for four years um, um, with um, kind of a traditional um, role uh, as um, um, director of um, a law and history library. And afterwards, um, I, I've, be, I, I've been um, to Lorraine University um, where I'm um, library curator. So I'm in charge of the research data support services. So we have a, a team of um, colleagues um, helping researchers with their data management plans, um, opening their data through repositories, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm also in charge of the bibliometrics services. And that's where um, I've come to work on open science monitoring. Um, because um, in France, since um, 2019, we have a national open science monitor uh, in place. So it's a dashboard where you can find indicators on the opening of publications, but now also uh, on research data and software. And uh, we were the first university to reuse the KPIs that were produced at the national level at Wait, a local just, level. Just to clarify, the acronym KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator and now referring to open science. Isn't that the holy gray, grail that everyone is running after? What are performance indicators for open science that are actually measurable? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question because um, we've been uh, always opposing bibliometrics and open science, uh, mm -hmm. well, at least for some time. And um, I guess that we should go back to the fundamentals of bibliometrics, which are to um, observe and to measure uh, something and not 
um, necessarily having in mind to um, assess people or institutions. And um, just to keep track of things, right? Like an inventory. Yeah. Like where are we and what do we have and how many there are and, and for what purpose, maybe. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Where are we and what can we do um, to, to help uh, the researchers? Mm -hmm. How can we do better? And that was the idea of the Open Science Monitor in France. It was not to say you're bad because you haven't opened your publications. No, it's uh, where, which are the communities where we need to do most, uh, when, where, where do we need to add more support? And um, we started with really uh, simple indicators um, with how many publications are in open access and how many are still not. How, how is it? And the different disciplines, um, do we observe differences um, with the different publishers, etc. Um, mm. But I completely agree. We we should be really careful about uh, indicators on open science. We don't want to redo the impact factor. Mm. Yeah. So the general impact factor. Um, also, just to. For those of the listeners who might not be familiar with um, some of the things we talked about here. So the journal impact factor is a measure that was introduced. I, I can't recall exactly when, but well, there's a paper that was published, I think, in the 70s or 80s, yeah. 60s or yeah. that time by uh, also a librarian, I think, or a research manager called Eugene Garfield. And the attention here was also the final measure to assess basically where the researches of an institution publish so that the library would know which journals to subscribe to, to make it more sufficient. And now yeah. this has been turned around, uh, mis misused really by the larger community, um, scholarly community, as a measure of quality, which it was never intended to be. Um, yeah, absolutely. So the higher the impact factor um, of a journal, the better the journal must be. Therefore, if you manage to publish in that journal as a researcher, it like, presumably speaks for quality of your research, which is not the case because the journal impact factors, are, I mean, the, the impact factor that a journal receives is not comparable across journals, not even yeah. the discipline let alone other disciplines. So, so yeah, so many institutions like SF, or initiatives like SFDORA, the San Francisco Declaration mm -hmm. of Research Assessment, and now CORARA also, the Coalition of... Uh, For the Advancement of Research, of research Assessment. assessment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms. <laughs> we'll link them in the show notes, you can look them up. Um, so there's to these two key initiatives and now organizations to look into also now what you've already um specialized in with open science monitor how can we find better assessments that are actually measurable um mm -hmm. not for quality assurance necessarily but to um incentivize and re set up reward systems to incentivize researchers to to be as open as feasible with their research and what you said earlier is also not to punish those who are not, because there are many good reasons to keep your results um, behind closed doors to a certain degree, because privacy issues, security, data security, national security in many research disciplines also, or, yeah, so security, yeah, and privacy. I just want to mention also because privacy issues are often put forward, especially by medical researchers. But then there's also a lot that you might want to keep confidential with regards to research data that um, addresses endangered animal and plant species, because that, yeah. Them, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, but then also other reasons like commercialization, product development, if you now agree with that approach or not, but at the end of the day, any research supposed to serve society 
and therefore needs certain levels of protection during the process of product development to get to the point of actually producing a product that can serve society from the knowledge mm. that we can accumulate. So, so it was to decide um, mm. when is the time to, to open the results is basically back to the researchers. But maybe that's another discussion to have. <laughs> um, unless you're looking into these questions also, because sometimes I figure like to for a PhD student to have a call of, oh yeah, I want to publish my data. And then what level of security do they have to make an informed assessment of, yes, this data is ready to be publicized openly on the internet, like what? <laughs> and, and then the other yeah. thing, like to publish data just randomly, like also often occurs, doesn't help unless it's fair, like meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the most important thing here being reusable, because if you just publish your raw data with no contextual information, it's of no use. And it's of no use, point. yeah. So what do you do to address all of these issues? We're just randomly <laughs> <laughs> no, Well, um, um, I guess regarding um, the indicators um, on open science um, pub productions, uh, such as publications or research data, I think that context is really, really important. Um, for the opening of publications, well, it's quite easy. Uh, when it's published, and especially when it's published thanks to public funding, mm. it should be open and public. So this one is pretty simple. Mm. But um, we have to keep in mind that we have really different um, scientific communities which have all their own practices. And for example, uh, mathematicians, they are really used to publicly open their research. Mm. Um, I don't know um, if it's true everywhere, but in France, for example, uh, researchers in law, they are very few to open uh, their publications uh, because we have a publication system in this particular field uh, which is really specific and not open science friendly, I, I guess. So when you have uh, researchers in law that are um, uh, opening their publications, well, it's a big step for them. So we should really have um, different approaches depending on the scientific community. And regarding research data, well, um, reuse um, of research data is something I think really important to try to measure, uh, to um, to incentivize um, the uh, opening of research data by others. And that that is something that we are trying to do in France in our Open Science Monitor um, because we have these indicators about research data mentioned in scientific publications. And we try to say, well, what is the share of publications that are mentioning the usage of research data? Among them, how many have produced their own data. We are looking into the publications, trying to find mentions of data sets. <laughs> Among the publications that are mentioning that they are using data sets, research data, we try to see if the authors of the publications are also the, produ the producers of these data sets. Mm -hmm. And if they are the producers, are these data sets openly shared or not. And that's um, the last one, the indicator about the sharing of data sets, I guess it's the most important. And um, well, I said openly shared, it's not totally, it's not the right word. I would say shared, just shared, because we can have um, research data online, but not publicly available to everyone. Mm -hmm and for perfectly good reasons. But uh, what's important is to, uh, to have them somewhere so that um, other researchers or the researchers themselves, themselves um, years after,
they would be able to come back to mm -hmm. the research data and get it. And yeah, I think it's a way if we focus on, well, is the data available online, even if it's in closed access? Um, I think it's a good way to start, mm -hmm. even if it's not a perfect indicator. And we try to do the same with uh, software mentions as well. Mm. And we also want to move forward with new indicators, this time on research data, not linked to publications, but simply put in repositories mm -hmm. and to have indicators on where they are, which kind of data, which license, etc. So we are trying to explore all that. But it's it's tricky because um, yeah. on publications you have authors, affiliations, more or less. It's you have many bibliographic databases mm -hmm. for research data and software. You don't have much catalogs, and um, it's quite hard to get uh, affiliations right. So yeah, we we are yeah. working on that currently. So um, there is a research data registry. It's basically the registry of research data repositories. Do yeah. you have or do you have insights in how to what extent this is actually being used by researchers? Is there like like if you would put a percentage, is it like like a wild guess even or from your insights will you say we are at, okay 80 percent actually use any of the repositories that are indexed there or fewer or i don't know 50 like where are we with actually having um, a place to check for suitable data repositories mm. yeah so um it would be really hard to give a percentage mm. uh but i think that mostly uh, the repositories used by researchers are in RE3 data, which is good news. Mm -hmm. um, but I was I would say, well, from my perspective in my institution, um, researchers they are not using RE3 re data, but we are. Mm -hmm. uh, when we help them um, in the process of publishing their data, um, RE3 data RE3 data is really useful to uh, find mm -hmm. suitable repositories mm. um so yeah for me it's really useful but uh it would be hard to say if researchers are really using it yeah and like from the way i've been searching through it i don't think we are at the point we can actually i mean maybe we are to some extent but where we have enough data in the registry to actually search across data sets i don't know oh well no, 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 it's really, it's, I think it's more at the repository level, mm -hmm. but uh, to, 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 to search for data sets, um, well, we use for now Google data set search, um, but mm -hmm. also, um, also now uh, you have um, the possibility to search for data sets in Open Alex. It's quite new. And um, there are not; they have not finished to um, upload all the um, data site dump. But we have uh, more and more data sets in Open Alex, and I guess it's really good news to see that uh, finally we have a catalog with publications and research data. And I'm crossing my fingers very hard to see software yeah. <laughs> in the near future, but it's another story. It's even more difficult than yeah, data it's sets. A, it's a huge cultural change for software. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny and sad at the same time because so much research relies on research software that's often yeah. deliberately developed for a particular research project. Why don't we give that those people, the developers also the necessary uh, credit? Well, under the yeah. credit taxonomy that we, have, again, we will put all the links um, in the show notes. <laughs> credit taxonomy, yeah. So to give credit yeah. to, to our software developers. Um, it's basically just a matter of awareness, especially in many research disciplines where it's not common practice, that that's actually something that's now changing for research culture. 
to not only have those people get the salaries, I mean, they get that, but then to also acknowledge their contributions in the scholarly reward system, so to say, so they can actually showcase the publications they contributed to. Mm. But what I have difficulties putting my, my, my head around is we are so obsessed with research articles, which of course also in a way links back to human nature and how we as humans communicate through stories, which a research article puts a beautiful story into or on the data behind. But then um, most open access articles that we now have access to um, don't have the da underlying data attached to it. <laughs> so it's basically <laughs> just stories and yeah. say it's yeah. claims without proof. So why why are we so I mean celebrating I mean of course it's a big achievement that we've come this far. The other burden is why do we have to publish so much? So we, mm. we have other things to focus on. Well, we know where that's coming from, but <laughs> like would we get to a point where unless a research article has the data set attached to it and clearly labeled and clearly um, archived in a repository, open or not. Um, otherwise, I would think and wish for the journal article to be of no value. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, as a matter of fact, is of no value unless you actually have the bootstrap, I mean, the you know, the traces of where people can find the actual data and access it, and the people who can provide access if it's not openly accessible. So, anyways. Maybe. Yeah, I think more and more publishers are asking for research data along with uh, the article. So, uh, not everyone, but uh, still it's a good step, I think. Um, well, there's also a danger uh, in there because uh, we see um, data repositories from publishers and um, some publishers are, um, yeah. we don't know what they are going to do with the data. And I keep saying to our researchers, please don't publish in those repositories because yeah. you won't have any rights on them anymore. Uh, use institutional repositories or uh, recognize repositories in your field mm -hmm. uh, because we don't want to um, to lose access over research data, uh, public research data. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. And another thing, maybe to give um, uh, a little a little bit of a different perspective um, in some some disciplines. Uh, research data is just not relevant. Uh, yeah, for sure. example, in fundamental mathematics, mm -hmm. they have no data. They mm -hmm. are just thinking. Formulas. And yeah, yeah. and uh, I've been helping researchers in uh, this field for their DMP and uh, their, their data management plan. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I don't have any data. And I, well, it's okay. Yeah. It's fine. Even uh, in social so... sciences, sometimes like theoretical physics, mm. even like where it just you know, and that's yeah. still a lot of work. So we don't want to diminish the effort. Um, but then there's no need for data to position anywhere. That's true. So yeah, that's the, the my obsession with being a biologist, where we <laughs> so sometimes keep forgetting that there's also other sciences. Um. So what do you? But you do have those also in the Open Science Monitor and then you apply other measures. Or how does the Open Science Monitor differentiate between those who produce data and those who don't and other differences? Yeah, so um, this, in this monitor, uh, we don't have any individual um, scores. So that's really, really important. Well, uh, we don't want to have individual results, but... Um, even though we would like to, we are not able to, <laughs> it's too too difficult. Uh, so it's really at the level of one institution. And uh, really what's important is to see where some data could be shared and are not. And then it's our job to go and see um, um, 
the research units uh, or the well it's not at the level of research units it's only disciplines but you can guess uh, which mm -hmm. research unit is um yes. um uh, is um uh, concerned so uh we can uh, you know propose some training or presentation of uh the data repositories and uh sometimes it's just they don't know where to publish them mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't want to as well mm -hmm. um but, but well, that's, uh, that's what, what we're trying to do that's also what i understand like i was the same as a phd student i was so embarrassed by my data i was like oh it's not good enough i should have more information coming out of it i've spent so many months and years why is my data not better than this so most people actually um like feel underwhelmed by their own data <laughs> yeah <laughs> they can understand that of and then the pressure, like, oh, I have to publish in this journal, blah, blah, again, I oh, we went there already, shouldn't mentor. So the important thing is, just to have this clear, again, like I keep stressing the point, it doesn't matter where you publish, to some extent it does, but you choose a repository or choose a journal that's actually affordable or free to publish in. Diamond of an access mm. journals are great. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's important what you publish, and the quality is in the data and not in what yeah. it is measure factor um but yeah, yeah. So that's where where i feel the reluctance of most researchers comes from like i don't think my data is ready to be published also i can't make sense of it of it how should anybody else then the other difficulty <laughs> is like researchers hardly ever have are given the time or find ways to make time for proper Abs um, data management and, and data cleaning um, or processing and some, I mean, so certainly just good enough for the publication and then next project, next um, grant application. So the pressure is real. Mm. Um, yeah, it's really, really why uh, those indicators really for me, it's not about assessment is really mm. how can we do better? And that's something uh, we try to um, push forward and the principles of open science monitoring that we are uh, uh, proposing uh, in uh, OSMI, the Open Science Monitoring Initiative mm -hmm. uh, that we launched uh, very recently. And that's really the idea to, to have um, common, um, common big principles about open science monitoring that you know, we could rely on to avoid uh, pitfalls and to avoid um, uh, wrong side effects uh, of the monitoring of open science, even mm -hmm. though uh, it's going to be hard, but we we need to try. Yeah. Well, uh, well, and luckily, many dedicated people, including yourself, are working on on finding good um, ways to get the open science monitoring um, to best possible use and implementation to encourage researchers around the world and also in France and Germany <laughs> and wherever you're happening <laughs> to, to open up your research a little bit more. And if it's just, and that's already a lot by making your data and your research practices fair, like as unfindable, accessible, mm. interoperable and reusable. Um, okay, so just um, concluding remarks, what's next? And what, where are the discussion with um, UNESCO, if that's um, feasible to tackle on? Or like yeah. what's the global approach now with open science monitoring? So now uh, the international consultation about the principles of open science monitoring is still open until the end of November. Mm -hmm. So everyone can contribute. Uh, we have uh, um, this document, the current draft of the principles, so everyone can read it and um, have, uh, read. it's important for everyone to have their say on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are planning to release uh, the final version of the principles next year. And also, um, the publishing of the principles will not be the end, but the beginning of mm -hmm. uh, the Open Science Monitoring Initiative, because we also want to have uh, working groups like on technical specifications to help institutions or country 
who would like to set up their monitoring uh, dashboard to have really um, some recipes to do so. Um, working groups also on community of practice, etc. And we are um, uh, discussing this uh, with UNESCO and also with the other initiators of OSMI, so um, the French Minister of Higher Education and Research, Université de Lorraine, INRIA, and also PLOS, Charité, and Spark Europe, um, because we are uh, the coordination committee of OSMI, it's in, um, the Université de Lorraine and Spark Europe. Mm. We, are, we have a meeting at the end of September uh, to organize all that. So you will hear from us very right. soon. And we will link to the review of the principles so everybody can have their say and free review and then make suggestions to the draft. I just wanted to add to what you said earlier to make these assessments or monitoring um, on an institutional and national level, I think makes a lot of sense. And the institutional level, I think I've mentioned here and there and heard mentioning, but it makes so much sense as compared to individual or departmental level because. I think I may very likely encourage also um, institutions to address open science practices across the house, basically across the yeah. institute. And even like simultaneously, hopefully also at the national level and the two can do that separately, but also come together to discuss what's our national approach and then regional and global will follow or also. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been so insightful. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> uh, à la prochaine. Until next time. See you. See you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanna. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at access to perspective.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management, and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.